resident life Jedi. That's mm-hmm. his new title, right? Life Jedi. Life Jedi, yeah. Um, British-born monk, Prat Pandit, uh, to talk about how to deal with these kind of situations in your life. When life throws you a curveball, what uh, what does Buddhism teach us and uh, what can we learn from Buddhism about how to deal with these difficult situations? <laughs> I am extremely pleased to welcome back to the show one of the busiest monks in Thailand, Prat Pandit. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Many people may not realize this, but you are a very difficult man to get on the show because you are extremely busy. You're all over the place. You're teaching courses. You're leading leading meditation meetings. You're writing blogs. Right. There's actually very few monks who can like really just sit and meditate all day. You, When you first ordain, you have this idea that's what you're going to do. But after a few years, you... you to survive in the temple, to keep yourself sane, you have to find a function. So some are teachers, some are the builders, some are administrators, some some are the studiers, and study Pali and scriptures and things like that. And everybody kind of finds a little niche and a little role to, to have stuff to do. If you don't have stuff to do, you kind of go crazy. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Does someone give you those tasks, or is it up to every monk to find their own? I think you find your own niche. You kind of gravitate towards the, in the direction that, that attracts you. So I used to like building, so I used to be one of the building monks. And, uh, but these days I tend to be more involved with the university and uh, organizing events in Bangkok. I would also say uh, you're a geek monk, too. A I geek? Mean, yeah. I mean that with all due respect. I myself am a geek and I'm proud of it. But you're a very technically a gadget proficient. monk. A gadget 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 fair monk. enough. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay. I but anyway, uh, we're we're glad you're we're glad you're here and we're glad you uh, had an evening off. Gadgets, gadget people, uh, they can use the technology, but the geeks, they can like reprogram it. Uh. <laughs> the geeks shall inherit the earth, isn't that how it goes? <laughs> Um, well, we thought it'd be good to have you on the show at this particular time in light of uh, all the stuff that's going on in Japan. Um, I feel kind of silly, actually, that uh, last week's show, we talked about how the death toll was quite low. Remember, we were like, it was like 26 or well, something. Yeah, like yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and now like, it's oh. in the thousands. Yeah. So uh, it turned out to be a little bit bigger deal than what we originally thought. Um, and in times of tragedy like this, it's always very common for many people to look for answers. Right. Where religion or books or news or, or however they, they do that, to try to find out why this happened, what's going on, how this affects their lives. So we thought it'd be interesting to have Pandit come on the show and explain Buddhism's teachings about tragic situations like this. What are, what are people looking for? What kind of answers can Buddhism give them? to maybe help them get over a a tough time? Well, there's two things. If you're trying to explain away the tragedy, that's one question. If you're trying to help people get through the tragedy, that's a different question. Let's start with explanation. I'm sure people in Japan are, some of them are wondering why. Why did my whole family get wiped out and I survived? Mm -hmm. But first, can can I just ask now, Japan is Zen Buddhist, is that correct? And can you Pseudo, explain? Actually, I think a lot of Shinto, a lot of, um, you know, a big mixture of things in Japan. Is there a very huge gulf between their beliefs and Theravada Buddhism in Thailand? Not essentially, no. Okay. No, Buddhism is fairly uh, even on that score. Okay, okay. I think that people, yes, you want to try and explain, like, why did this happen? But the point is that when something bad happens to you, you don't have a way of understanding it because it's not fitting your expectations of the world. And there was a very fabulous psychi- psychologist called George Kelly, and he, he invented construct theory, which basically was you view the world not directly as it is, but through a series of constructs. Constructs are your expectations of how you expect the world to be. Then when something Uh, startling happens, you get in what George Kelly called being corked your constructs down. (laughs) And that means you don't have a way to explain. Like if there was a funny noise outside your room that you'd never heard before, this would be kind of distressing to you until you can investigate it or try and figure out what it is. Same with a big tragedy like this, people want to try to explain it. Really it's as a way just to 
reform their constructs or their expectations of the world which and the world hadn't obeyed their constructs it hadn't followed their expectations and according to George Kelly if you can find any kind of explanation for this th that's good it doesn't really matter whether the explanation is right or wrong or where it comes from any kind of explanation that gives you a handle on the the event that's occurred and it gives you some kind of indication of what you should do about it right can, so can another word for construct be belief you could say beliefs you could say expectations you could say a series of filters cognitive filters something like that hmm. yeah it's, so if, it's funny a lot of people say the same about religion it doesn't matter what religion you choose as long as it appeals to you as long as it touches you as long as it explains certain uh, questions you have right there's a lot of research into happiness there's one guy Ed Dina I think Dita Dina uh, and he interviewed 1.2 million people about happiness and it was quite interesting the results people were self-measuring their own happiness on a level of 1 to 10 and he was looking for what makes people happy and money didn't do it and what country you lived in didn't do it your social status didn't do it what kind of car you drive didn't do it uh, what kind of computers you have didn't do it oh I, <laughs> I beg to differ <laughs> The things that did matter, people who were married reported more happiness. That's questionable of whether the wives were watching the husband while they were writing out the... <laughs> That's good news for me. <laughs> wait, wait, when was this done? Uh, this was done over a long period of time, and actually it's been replicated many, many, many times. Oh, okay, okay. Basically the same results. Being married helped, but another one was being part of a religious group. And as you said, it didn't actually matter what religious group you were part of. Basically, any kind of group, that, any religious group you were part of would make you self-measure your happiness being higher. Now, this may be just that religious people believe they're happier than everyone else. It doesn't mean they necessarily are happier than everyone else. Another thing was how many friends you had. But basically, the more often you went to a religious meeting of any kind, the happier you get, you reported yourself to be yeah could it be any kind of group though your bowling league could accomplish the same thing that's one it? of the comments on this research was that the more friends that you have also the happier you are so if you're part of a group then obviously that just make, means you have more friends the point was that it didn't actually matter which religious group you were part of it was just being part of any group right so the same with this disaster it's not really a case of which religion's explanation is correct, people tend to find explanations in their religions. And basically, they, whatever religion or whatever explanation they can find, they're just as happy with that. It was interesting, actually. I kind of saw that recently. Someone posted about that, and, and it said, like, Christians rank themselves as one of the happiest. And I, I was thinking... Self-reporting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, if you go back a few, few, few decades or so, a few hundred years during the Crusades, you had the Christians who were obviously very happy, but the lands that they were conquering and taking over obviously weren't as happy that they were invading it. So it's interesting that religion can make one group of people extremely happy, another group of people not so happy. It's all perspective. Right. right? <laughs> I think the big point is it makes people believe they're happy. Right, right, right. Whether they're actually happier or not is another question. <laughs> That's probably an entirely different existential conversation that could go on for hours, I imagine. So Buddhist explanations of this, um, of natural disasters, within Buddhism you have different causes for things. So you have biology as a cause, you have physics as a cause. If you sit on an apple tree and an apple falls and bonks you on the head, this is physics. This isn't the universe making Newton dream up gravity. This is just straightforward physics. Sooner or later the apple's going to fall. And you also have karma, and then you also have mind. So some things are, are go by the cause of mind, some things go by the cause of karma, by physics, by biology. Uh, in the case of a natural disaster, that's just the workings of the world. There isn't any real sensible explanation for it. In fact, the real Buddhist take on it is, this is samsara, this is the world of life and death and suffering. And only enlightenment can get you out of it. I see. So, we really have no choice. We have no... Is, does that play in with destiny? I mean, we're just puppets in this theater? And... Yeah, destiny, though, would still imply some kind of reason 
for the disaster. And really the only reason is it's on the fault line and the, the, the pressures have built up in the earth and so it went. Mm, okay. So there's no kind of <coughs> cosmic uh, control over some, some people, why some people lived and some people didn't. Right. So you do have this idea of collective karma. Now karma means if something happens to you, this is caused from something in your past. So if something happens to a big group of people, you have this idea of collective karma, that, that maybe all of them have done something in the past and now they are receiving their karma. But, you know, I kind of agree with George Kelly. I think people are just fishing around for some kind of explanation or any kind of explanation just to try and get a handle on something that's difficult to understand. Right. So there's very little within Buddhism to really warrant an explanation of collective karma. There was one story, the, the original suttas are one part of Buddhism. They, these are what the Buddha actually said. And then you have a second set of commentaries on the original suttas. And the commentaries, there's a lot of collective karma in there. So, for example, the Buddha at the end of his life, his kingdom that he was supposed to be the king of actually got destroyed by one of the neighboring cities. And then the army that destroyed the kingdom camps in a dry riverbed and then they all lost their lives that night in a flash flood. And this was attributed to collective karma for both groups. However, this is all commentarial, this is stuff that came up, it's not actually the Buddha's teachings. Within pure Buddhism you don't really have this idea of collective karma. Hmm. Is collective karma always bad? No, I guess not, it can be good. So yeah. on the flip side, if someone were to believe in that, someone Being might think that... Being born in Canada that, must mean that you're very... Just for being so awesome, simply, <laughs> or our next lives are going to be amazing. I'm going to come back as a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> so what did I do wrong to be born in England? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just were born in the wrong century. You need to go back to 1800s. Yeah. When your then, religion was, the... was making your country happy by taking over Africa. <laughs> well, I was, it's interesting that uh, you say collective karma because um, we were just talking about it a few minutes ago about uh, a lot of... Uh, People online have been saying, I might add, ignorant, less informed pricks, really, to plainly say it, have been saying, oh, Japan, this is karma because of Pearl Harbor and something like that. And someone might actually really believe that. I mean, I think most sane people would would toss that aside and say that's a ridiculous concept. But this person who believes that might really believe that. And that might be just the way the universe works, whereas most other people would, would disagree with that. The point is we'll never know. We can never know. And so just rationalizing it away, I mean... That's the key word there, rationalization. And this is what studied psychology, Freud. He saw a woman being hypnotized on a stage and the hypnotist told her at one o'clock you will go and open a window. And then he carried on with the show. He took her out of the, the state, sat her down, and they carried on with the show. And then an hour later at one o'clock, she gets up and opens the window. And so the hypnotist asked her, why did you open that window? And she said, well, I was cold. To everyone else, this was just a trick with the, the hypnotist. But to Freud, this was really interesting because she had done something for a reason that she can't remember the reason. Now, having done it, she rationalized what had happened. This started psychology. This is what psychology is all because about. Because Freud didn't tell her she was cold. She just tell her to open the window. And then she said it because... She made that up to rationalize away her behavior. And this is what we do with these strategies. We're trying to rationalize them away. If you can find a reason for it, then in your own mind, it's okay. And it's not okay. It's a disaster. Right. This is one of the problems that I have re with religion personally, is that you can use it to rationalize almost anything. Right. Uh, from you know ter terrible evil to extreme yeah. good, and I personally I, I think that a, that something that people use to live their lives by that can be so easily twisted is not something that really stands stands a test of uh, logic and reason to me. But yeah, quite so. The other aspect with this um, tragedy then is as we see people want an explanation, so they tend to turn to religion. You would think that religions would suffer in times of disaster, but actually. All religions prosper in times of disaster. Uh, but one of the things the religions can do is they can provide actual effective assistance. So both Christianity, Buddhism, and Judaism, whatever, all religions are quite good at doing this. Buddhism is good too on this level that you can give a framework for people. That is, we have an expectation that the world is going to be 
uncontrollable, always impermanent, and that we shouldn't be complacent. So we have this teaching, and then when something like this does happen, we got, well, kind of like I told you so, but we have the mechanisms to deal with that. Mm. So then the communities can come together and they can provide communal assistance, you can provide material assistance, you can help out your friends and the people who have suffered. So religion is quite good on that level, is that it will come together in times of disaster and will actually provide real genuine help as well as the rationalization. You mean like with aid, <coughs> like food supplies right. and stuff like that? Yeah, because yeah. usually the religions are quite well set, set up with an infrastructure. You know. What about if some Japanese person came to you and said, I just, uh, like I saw one, one lady today, her, she was an older lady and her whole family is gone. They were in the house and she was out shopping. Her whole entire family is gone. Her house is gone. Obviously, she's in a lot of emotional pain. If she came to you, what would you say to her to try to make her feel better, change her outlook on the future or something like that? You know, if she went to a Christian pastor, he'd probably say something. I don't know what. But if she came to you looking for some emotional help, what would you say? Well, this actually happened in the Buddhist time. And one woman, she lost her husband and her children, and she lost some in a fire, some in a flood, all within a few days. And she was distraught, and eventually she went to the Buddha's camp. So the story goes, he told her, he said, I want you to go around all the houses in the neighborhood, and I want you to take one mustard seed from every house that hasn't had somebody die. So she went calling on all the houses until she realized that every single house has had somebody who had died. So this helped her. I'm not sure if it would help the Japanese lady. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the houses are gone. <laughs> um, he was quite extreme, the Buddha. He was teaching enlightenment and he was quite tough and rough and single-minded about this. And he was never teaching any kind of social philosophy or he wasn't teaching anything that should have been turned into a religion or you should try and run a country by. He was teaching monks under trees how to get this supernatural, existential uh, enlightenment, whatever that is. But that, that sounds, that, that, that does sound harsh. Like, oh, why did this happen to me? Basically, he was like, hey, happens to everyone. Deal with it. Which is actually, actually the truth. Is that an answer? It's is actually that a, the truth. It's not going to help this, this Japanese lady who's just come and asked me. But. That does seem surprisingly harsh. I'm, I'm, mm. a bit, I'm a bit surprised at that. Mm. But it, I mean, if they, if, if, if that's your belief or your construct, though, I mean, it does actually kind of help you in a way because if you then you can go through life and if stuff happens, you're not you don't so feel, thrown off course by it. You don't feel victimized. Right. Like, why did it happen to me? What did I do wrong to make this happen? Well, right. you didn't do anything wrong to make this happen. Furthermore, of course, in Buddhism, your death is only a, is a kind of an illusion or a temporary thing that you, you carry on from lifetime to lifetime. So all your friends and your family, they're not actually like dead as in wiped out of the universe. They've simply passed on to the next lifetime. And all of us are going to have to pass on to the next lifetime. All of us have already passed on from many lifetimes in the past. What would you say to someone uh, who has something like this happen to them and they just, they just don't buy it anymore? They say this is enough. The, the universe is a terrible place. There is obviously no God, there is no plan, it's just a tragedy waiting to happen. No one can help me, there's no explanation, and I renounce religion. It's, it's a crock. Sure, that's their rationalization of what's happened to them, isn't it? So that's their, their new construct that they're making to deal with their circumstance. So it really, it's no different from saying it's all in the plan. I should say here that you, you, you keep asking me what I would say, and... <laughs> I'm not necessarily the best person as a therapist and one of the things that being a lover of psychology I have been keen to promote within Buddhism is this role that especially monks and nuns actually are looked at or used for lay people to consult with but they've never had any training in doing this so you're asking me as a Buddhist monk what would I say to this lady right what we should really be doing is saying to therapists how do you help people who are in this kind of situation? And then we want to take the therapist to train the monks and nuns on how to give counseling. This to me is a, is a much more important and practical question. So when you're giving counseling, there's very definite steps that you can do to help people with that. 
I but think. you're more likely to get those from your local doctor or your local therapist than you are your local monk or nun. I'll give you one example. One man, he lost his 14-year-old daughter to a brain tumor, brain cancer. It took her about a year for her to die. And he was utterly distraught. He couldn't work. He couldn't look after his wife. He couldn't earn money. He couldn't do anything. He was just ripped apart. And he went to a monk in a temple and uh, he was a Buddhist. He was from Laos, actually. He went to the temple and he asked the monk. The monk said to him, don't you know everything's impermanent? Don't you know everything's suffering? Close your eyes and meditate and all the suffering will go away. Now this monk was well known for meditating for six hours at a time. So he went into meditation and when he opened his eyes, the man had gone, of course. This kind of imbecilic, is that the word, behavior, <laughs> points to the fact that actually very often religious people aren't trained to be able to give counseling. And this is one of the things that the Christian churches were much better at. Until psychology in the last 50 years has really studied the topic, it was Christians who were the world's best at being able to give counseling to people in times of disaster. I would say before psychology really became a science, probably religion was the closest thing there was. Right. Right. But now we do have this science, and I firmly believe that monks and nuns and ordinary people should know basic counseling skills. Yeah. I think it's also uh, important to remember that the reason we're asking you is because it's either I ask you or Tony, or Tony yeah. asks you or me. <laughs> I think it's safe to say we'd rather ask you. <laughs> of the three yeah, of us, I definitely you. think you're the most qualified. You got the right <laughs> uniform for it. So, <laughs> But yeah, that's interesting what you said. I remember um, Richard Dawkins said that in, in his book. Um, the God Delusion, he said that, you know, when we, uh, I want some dentistry done, we go see a dentist right. and we go see a plumber to fix our plumbing. But why, when we have these kind of tragedies or these kind of unknowns, we go see the the, the pastor or the, the nun or something like that? Why is this mystical realm given to these people when they may not be as qualified right. a, as a psychologist to deal with these situations? Um, but I think people and it's though transference of wisdom. For example, Einstein was very clever, and he said that the world needs a cosmic religion that's adaptable, etc., etc. And he said Buddhism fits this bill. So Buddhists always champion this, and they put it on their websites and things. <laughs> but what makes Einstein qualified to talk about religion? I mean, you wouldn't ask him about haircuts, would you? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, if he'd chosen a different religion, Buddhists wouldn't be saying, well, Einstein recommends Catholicism or something like that. Again, it's rationalization. So it's, it's a transference. And what happens with, uh, in the West especially, the church through the Dark Ages controlled every single aspect of life. So everything that you did was told by the church, was dictated to by the church. If you wanted to know how many teeth were in a horse's mouth, you would go and look in the in the church. That was where they had the, the learning and the books and everything else. So now you have this thing where uh, the church even tells people whether to use contraceptives or not. And that's not what the church should be delving into. That's what families should be looking to those kind of questions. So this idea that the religion has to answer every kind of question is actually wrong. The Buddha was an expert on Enlightenment, that was his thing. He was very single-minded and determined on that. Other aspects, of course, then you can't really look to Buddhism for the answers. Can you explain to me what is enlightenment? I've heard you say this word a few yeah. times. I don't understand what that <laughs> means. Are you walking around with a halo over your head? Can you float? What does that you mean float? when someone <laughs> is enlightened? Uh, it's hard to put into a, into a few words, but it's the idea that there is some aspect of your experience that's permanent and unchanging and this is the core of your being now we don't call it a soul because it's not owned by you it's not part of your psyche or your views and opinions or your wants but if you can meditate to the level where you attain to this then everything changes you know all desire changes uh, you should be in perfect bliss you should be beyond life and death birth and suffering Sounds like so, the end of 2001, the space odyssey. The explanation <laughs> doesn't really help very much. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but it's a long answer to to okay, really That'll be our next show. <laughs> you got to meditate, man. I did Start want to now, mention Tony. this thing that I mentioned earlier, the complacency, which also is a part of Buddhism, that people get very complacent with the world around them. 
and don't reflect on their own mortality. So within Buddhism we have this marana sati or reflection on death. We're supposed to continually remind ourselves that I'm going to die. All of this is going to change. Whatever I have, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise and separated from me. You can see this on a personal level, so that when there's a disaster, people don't know how to handle it. Either disaster in the environment or a personal disaster. Because you have this set of expectations or a complacency about how the world is going to treat you. And this changes when you get terrible sickness or you lose your eyes or your legs or your wife or something like that. Now, when we look at Japan, then there was, as with every country in the world, there is a complacency. They know they're on a fault line, and yet they're building nuclear stations just above sea level on the coast. I mean, that is pure complacency. That, you know, anybody who is sensible around nuclear power knows that you don't build it in an area where you might get a tsunami, or you don't build it in an area where it's going to get earthquake damage. Is it complacency or slight arrogance? The Japanese thought,、both. "Hey, we can、uh, we can out engineer this." Yeah, both. It is a kind of arrogance. Yeah, but it's not just the Japanese. Of course, every country in the world is doing it. You look at Britain; you get three inches of snow, and the the country stops. <laughs> <laughs> and we all living with this kind of complacency. You expect your health to be as good tomorrow as it is today. You expect your wife to still be there. You expect your bank balance to still be there. And then you're not equipped for when things change. How can you equip yourself? That's a difficult question. In life, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's different for everyone, right? Right. But one part of it is not investing your whole being externally, but investing a lot of your work internally. Which means that if your whole identification is wrapped up with your family and your house and your job and your car and your environment, those things are going to change. If you're Being and expectations and your self-identity is turned inwards to yourself, then you get the foundation of being. Then you get the sense that even if things happen on the outside, that will be of a very great change. Internally, you still have the mechanisms to deal with it. You have a way to handle suffering, and the whole of Buddhism revolves around this question of suffering and how you handle suffering. If you've thought about it, if you've meditated with it, if you've practiced with it. Then you do actually have a way to handle things. You aren't being as complacent as ordinary people. Well, you know, I remember, I remember when I used to live in Canada. I, I, you know, I probably said this many times on the show, but I used to have some extremely wealthy clients. One thing that always surprised me about many of these clients was how little concern they had about money. Some of them would lose it、uh, millions, and、uh, they were never concerned about it because they had that inside. They had the thinking that they could make millions again. You know, it, it wasn't a concern, that that aspect of their life wasn't a concern for them. It was very interesting to me because these people could lose and make more money than some of my other clients would make their whole lives. Yeah, you know, some other clients always struggling, always trying to pay the bills and all that. And yet, I had these other clients who would lose millions of dollars in a bad business deal, or get robbed, or stolen, or whatever, and they wouldn't bat an eye about it because they knew. Somebody said that if you took all the money in the world and divided it up evenly amongst everybody, within ten years it would be back in the hands of the rich again. I think a lot of people's wealth is is, is, is a direct result of their thinking, because I saw a huge difference between the ones who had money and the ones who didn't, and the way they thought and their、mm. actions and all that. It was just like clear as night and day for me. So I got to try to figure out that new fund of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also ask you a bit about、um, while we're talking about it, the the nuclear plants in、uh, in in Japan? You I, I know know a lot about nuclear power, how it's made, how it works. Yeah, more than me anyway. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to ask Tony about it. I prefer to ask you. The plants that they built in Japan were they a good design? Were they poorly well, the designed? Fabulous they? design,、um, but it is an old design, and so basically with the, these kind of Uh, nuclear power stations. You set off, usually with uranium, but you set off a nuclear reaction, and inside your core, what they call the core, in the core to control the reaction to stop it turning into a bomb, you have control rods, and these will absorb radiation,、uh, which means they absorb、uh, neutrons. To set the the nuclear fission process, you have to fire a neutron at something like heavy uranium. 
and then the uranium will split. And when it splits, it gives off a lot of heat and power. So the control rods then, they dampen down, they soak up neutrons that are floating around, and they dampen down the reaction. I see. Now this actually worked fine in Japan, and as soon as the earthquake happened, they lowered all the control rods into the reactors. The trouble is, the thing is still very hot. Even though it stopped reacting, it's still going to be very hot for a very long time. And if you don't keep taking that heat away, then it's going to get hotter and hotter. That's what they do with the water. Right. Uh, well, water or gas, so you have different mechanisms to take the heat away. So their core was actually not damaged. The problem was the station around the core was damaged. And because of that, they couldn't get the water in to cool the remaining temperature. Uh, so that's the problem. Now, they were very well designed, but the point is that if you're building a nuclear station, you don't build it that close to a fault line, and you don't build it at low levels where a tsunami is going to hit it. You want to build it higher up. Fundamentally, with nuclear power, this is a really big and important uh, occurrence in the world because the world is just coming round again at the moment to thinking about building more nuclear power plants. As is Thailand has been Thailand, and now people are going to stop thinking about it. The fact is that nuclear power is really quite a wonderful and a very clean technology. For example, right now they're worried about the radiation levels are double the safety limits that would be for somebody who is working in a nuclear plant. But, you know, I had a pizza today, and that's probably like eight times as much sodium as I'm supposed <laughs> to eat in a day. It's probably five times as much salt as I'm supposed to eat in a day, but I'm all right. But come on, can you really compare sodium to <clears throat> radiation? Yes, if the radiation level is at double the level that you would expect a worker in a plant to be exposed to, then yes, it is absolutely harmless. Now, the trouble is that, that because of this particular disaster, people are going to be turning away from nuclear power again. And, and yet, nuclear power is a very good and very viable option. It provides about 20% of the world's electricity, Primarily in France, they have a, I think it's about 80% of their power comes from nuclear uh, and a lot more in the States. Now, there are many different kinds of nuclear power that you can do. One kind is called a pebble bed reactor. And these pebble bed reactors, they don't require water to cool them down. So they can't overheat and they can't explode. And so these are very promising technology. Another kind is thorium. Thorium is very, very widely available in the world. Much better than uranium at producing power. But you can't make nuclear bombs out of thorium. That's probably a good thing. That's a good thing, but this is why the States, France and Israel didn't want to push thorium of technology. <laughs> they wanted to put all the investments into of uranium. Of course, technology. why am I not surprised? But wait, can I go back for a sec there? From what I've read is that when, if these fuel rods melt, that there's a containment area underneath in the core that they'll just melt into that. And assuming that that hasn't been damaged by the earthquake, that's about it, right? It just yes. stays in this containment area yes. and eventually they will try to cool it. So the risk of a Chernobyl style explosion from Japan, this one in Japan, it is quite low. Is, is that correct? It is. But what happens is as you pump water into it, the heat will split the water into oxygen and hydrogen. And this, of course, That's what exploded. This, is, this is what explodes. And also Chernobyl, it wasn't actually a nuclear explosion. It was a hydrogen explosion that blew all the radioactive material everywhere. So it's not like a nuclear bomb. You can't get a nuclear bomb from a power station. That's impossible. It's not going to occur. You can get a big explosion that throws a lot of radioactive material out. As I said, pebble bed reactors, they don't require water to cool them down. They're naturally self-cooling or they, they cool with gas, usually helium. But So these kinds of reactors are very, very much safer. But if you compare something like thorium, uh, one ton of thorium used as a nuclear fuel is equal to about 3,500,000 tons of coal. Right, One ton of this material, 3.5 million tons of coal. When you start weighing up the risks of three and a half million tons of coal burning, spewing out sulfur and everything else into your atmosphere, compared to the nuclear power, which even the waste, when you have it, you can contain it. 
you know, it's actually very much worthwhile. What would you say to people, though, who say that we should use this、uh, disaster in Japan as an opportunity to look at alternative sources of power, not nuclear power, like wind, solar? Sure,、like、and solar is the way the world will go. I'm very certain of it.、Um, if you just covered current solar panels and covered all the roofs in the world, you would have far more power than you could. Possibly use.、Mm. You know, I think that every day in Thailand when it's hot, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> see all these buildings that are being air conditioned. I thought,、yeah. you know, if all that glass was solar powered, you、they、could power the whole building. They actually have a glass that does that now, and it will. It's about three percent efficient as opposed to fifteen percent for a normal solar panel. But the idea being, when you build a new building, is you can cover your whole fascia with glass, as many buildings do, and this will actually produce power. It's actually very hard to do in Thailand because the sun is always above you. In the northern hemisphere, the sun is always in the south, so you cover your south-facing wall with panels, and they'll generate power. In Thailand, the the sun is always above you, and your roof area is tiny compared to your front the front face of your building. Furthermore, the sun goes from the east to the west, so your panels either you have to move your panels with the sun, or you have to have two sets of panels. On either side of your roof, so it's actually quite tricky to do solar in in this part of the world. You know, nuclear power is kind of it's kind of surprising to me. Like、uh, like I didn't know anything about nuclear power until I was in Germany actually about five years ago, and there was this side of this car museum at this little energy museum, and I went in there just to find out about it. I didn't know nuclear power. All it does is just generate steam. Yeah, from water. a lot of people think it's as a like Star Trek nuclear core thing、right. with dilithium crystals and flux capacitors, but basically it's just a very efficient steam engine. Right. To make steam to power、yeah. a turbine, yeah, very much so. But you got to consider one pound of uranium is equal to about one million gallons of gasoline. This means that a handful, if we take the thorium, basically a handful could of thorium could power a city for a month. So it's still quite mind-boggling. But you can't get any bombs out of it, and therein lies the problem. <laughs> Um, just as a little、uh, addition on the end here, it's not really related to anything we were just talking about, but I just got a. a well, I guess it's sort of related to the to the Buddhist question, but I just got a a tweet from someone named Johnny, and he asked me a question. He says, "Please ask Prabhendit why Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism is so poorly received in Thailand. Has Dalai Lama ever visited Thailand?" He did visit Thailand. I think it was 1970 or something. He said he was very well received, and he said Buddhism was very strong here. Vajrayana Buddhism is well received here, I think. People are very respectful、uh, of it. There's a great deal of interest in it. We just did two monks, Pangchok Rinpoche and Ringo Chulku, we had here in January and February, and they're very, very well received. Thich Nhat Hanh is here at the end of this month. He's a, a Zen monk from Vietnam.、Uh, there's a Mahayana Buddhism. And he's a huge following here. He's opening up centers in Pak Chong and in Chiang Mai. His last talk here in Mahajula University, there was at least five thousand people turned up. Wow! All right, so there you go, Johnny. Done. Cool. Well, there you go. We go from Japan to nuclear power to Vietnamese monks. Man, I learn. I learn almost as much. And pizza, and we found out that monks eat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me about that earlier. <laughs> But in the mornings. Oh, only in the mornings. In the morning. Cold pizza is the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for that. <laughs>、um, thanks for coming on the show. We really enjoyed it. Okay, glad to be here. Thank you. Amazing stuff. My mind is always just blown right out of the water whenever he's here. We start talking about something little, like a small Buddhist precept or something, and then end up spending 15 minutes talking about nuclear power. <laughs> he goes from like, "So, Panet, tell us about this pencil," and then he's like, he's off on the history of evolution and nuclear An power. Incredibly smart guy. Really, really interesting. I mean, he's just great insights, and I always like having him on the show. Absolutely.